There's a story that sums up the reign of the self-declared president for life of Venda, the late Patrick Mpepu. When asked why he wanted his homeland to be independent, he said, Mangope did it, Mantanzima did it, why can't I did it? A funny tale about a man with a standard two education who had a simple answer to all opposition. Crush it. This week's Truth Commission hearing in Toyondu proved just how well he did it. Human rights abuses in the Bantustans were carried out mainly by its police and army. Tales of severe torture to deaths in detention spanned more than a decade from the late 70s to the early 90s. Jan Turner and Gail Regan explore why residents called the Venda Bantustan a place of horror. The history being told and made by the Truth Commission is not without its ironies. Here in Toyondo, the Va Venda came to tell their stories in what was once the Venda homeland's parliamentary assembly room. This was the seat of power for the regimes of Mpepu, Ravele and Ramushwana, rulers of the Bantustan from independence in 1979 to reincorporation in 1994. Throughout the 70s and 80s, political issues in Venda mirrored the issues current for its big brother, the Republic of South Africa. Black Consciousness and the UDF focused above-ground opposition, while Venda's proximity to the borders of Mozambique and Zimbabwe made it an area of semi-underground activity too. This week, the Commission heard how the methods used to counter opposition during Patrick and Pepu's reign also echoed those methods popular amongst security forces in the Republic. And uh, they said, uh, you kids around this village, Saoro likes uh, to strike too much. And uh, they said, we don't want to uh, ask any questions anymore. And uh, all of them came into me and hit me. The time that they were hitting me, the last person who hit me, uh, the shambok went to, into my ear, into, into my eye. And it, uh, my eye was splitted. In 1976, Simon Farisani became the first black dean of Buster House, established by white Lutheran missionaries a century before. The message was simple. That apartheid was seen, it came from the devil, and all serious people must pull their resources to support the uh, freedom struggle of our people. This place used to be the heartbeat of that mobilization. For churchmen like Farisani and his friend Chipiwa Moepe, mobilization involved more than hearts and minds. Now, uh, uh, one time I had gone to Johannesburg to attend a church council meeting. When I came back from that church council meeting, Pastor Posiwa, who was deputy director of the church center, I was dean and director of this church center, informed me that uh, uh, two or three freedom fighters came here and asked for help. He called Pastor Mahamba and they came and discussed with the freedom fighters. The freedom fighters had uh, hidden their equipment, and ammunition somewhere on the mountains. And they wanted the pastors here to use the van to go and collect that. And the pastors were saying, look, we can help you as much as we can, but if we carry these weapons, the police may be waiting. There are lots of roadblocks. They'll arrest us, take the church van, and then they may even close down the center. But we can give you whatever help we should give you. In the course of 1981, there were a series of bomb explosions all over the Republic. The ANC's soldiers were operating from Paul Petersburg to Cape Town. Venda was one route into and out of the Republic. But MK didn't see the homeland as merely a safe corridor. In October 1981, guerrillas hit the Sibasa station in the heart of the Bantustan capital itself. Three policemen died in the attack. When someone informed the police that the bombers had been harboured by the local church, their reaction was wide-reaching and harsh. I remember uh, two days before that fateful day, uh, my wife and I and another couple uh, were driving to Natal, where I was going to address a graduation 
function at the Lutheran Theological College. And on our way out, we got word that Ike had been detained the night before. We thought it was just one of those detentions that would not end up in Chipiwa's death. Next day in the morning, Saturday, just before I went to deliver the a graduation a lecture, I got a call from Pastor Mahamba telling me that they got a reliable report from a doctor who came to inform the family that Ike had died. It was after his death that many more people were detained, including uh, myself. The security police came, and it was my turn. They collected me. And the first question they raised in that security police car was, if we had not come to detain you, what kind of dangerous sermon would you, were you going to preach at Chipiwa's funeral? Of course, that was a funeral I would never attend. Vendaland was ideal guerrilla territory, close to the borders of countries friendly to the ANC and PAC, mountainous, and clustered with tropical orchards of bananas and avocados. But it was the support of Vendaland's people that made the difference for liberation armies. Willy Mudal, a former black consciousness and church activist, was one such person. This is the room where those guys used to, in which those guys used to sleep. And now at this stage it's now demolished because we have now a new structure that and my mother here used to cook for those guys for a period of two weeks or so, and it was not only once. When things were bad, we used to come and hide here. Mm. And when other guys were being hunted down by the uh, security police, we would come and accommodate them here. And when other guys come from outside, when it was bad, the police died, they then, uh, according to the terminology of the system, terrorists, and in our language, freedom fighters, when they come are in, for their missions, we would hide them for a day or two or for whatever period was needed. As members of the community slipped into more covert forms of resistance, the Venda regime switched to open terror. Ntsundeni Chivasi's husband, Mugivela Chivasi, was beaten to death in detention. He was accused of storing arms at his farm. Mafungu Denga lost his mind after severe torture, which included being fed food mixed with feces. He was accused of harboring terrorists. Mabuhati Radamba spent 108 days in solitary confinement. His prison, a corrugated shack. His crime, which he confessed to, giving food to MK soldiers. Reverend Simon Farasani had some explanation for the support the vendor community gave to the Liberation Armies. Many of them did operate in this area. It was hospitable, people accommodated them. And there were few instances where they were reported to the security forces. But generally, people harbored them, people covered them, people fed them, people looked after them because they shared the same goal. The only dividing thing was the fear and the harsh consequences that came to one if one was found to be uh, 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 involved in that kind of activity.